a detailed book on the Army of the Potomac had not been written for years. Why take up this project and what is your seventh book? Well, I, I thought that a, a book on the Army of the Potomac really was needed. Um, most of the writing on the Civil War, particularly in the East, it oftentimes focuses on the other army. Because you have Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson and Jeb Stewart and the Army of Northern Virginia. And Bruce Catton had written a wonderful trilogy in the 1950s, but uh, nobody had really written a one-volume history of the Army in a century. And uh, I thought with the way the you know, demands of modern scholarship were and things like that and all the available letters and diaries of common soldiers that had never been really tapped into one volume work. That's why it appealed to me. And besides, it's, I, it's a great story and I want to, I like great stories if you're going to do a, bo a book on something. Wars are usually defined by generals, Eisenhower, MacArthur, Schwarzkopf, you know, and mm. down the line. In a lot of ways, was this war before Grant defined by Lincoln, the president? Well, it was defined by Lincoln in the East. Uh, this is, uh, there's no army in our history who has so been so closely identified with a president in the Army of the Potomac. And uh, really, that's why I uh, chose the title I did. Uh, uh, but um, I guess the general who would define the army in the East was George McClellan. Uh, remained enormously popular, uh, but a, a, a general who just by saying his name generates controversies today. Uh, and the re reason for it is, you know, he creates this wonderful army and then he just refuses to use it. He, uh, I don't think he quite appreciated, though he said he did, but I don't think he appreciated the weapon he created. And then the other thing is he writes these very revealing, if, but at the same time highly critical and uh, harsh letters to his wife about the president, the cabinet. Uh, because McClellan was a general who was socially and politically conservative, came from a, his father founded Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia, so he came from the Philadelphia elite, if you will, and he was conservative. And then it, while he's a general, though, Congress and administration is moving closer and, cl and uh, to uh, emancipation. And McClellan, to him, that was what was wrong, and it would only make the Southerners fight harder. But of course. In most cases, Lincoln was, had the right ear and McClellan had the tin ear when it came to that. We talk in sports and use the analogy, play not to lose. Was this a case, did McClellan fight not to lose instead of fighting to win? Oh, I think that's a very good analogy. Uh, he did, he, he, at least it seems that way. Uh, you know, he held back uh, troops uh, at Antietam, which he's been vilified for. Uh, he did say, and I and I I tried not to psychoanalyze him. Some some have, and you know I think he go down a slippery slope there. But at one time he wrote, "If this army is defeated, the cause in the country is lost." And I think he was right because for the Confederacy to win the war, they'd have to win it in the East. So McClellan did fight the war. It seemed uh, as if he, you know, don't take risk, be cautious. Uh, the worst, though, I think that can be said of his generalship. Uh, was two incidents where uh, during the Seven Days campaign, the end of June of 62, he literally, knowing the battle's going to occur, twice rode away from his army and left it to his subordinate and the men in the ranks. And he, he deserted his men. And, uh, uh, but yet, at the same time, you know, no Union general would come close to Richmond as he did until Grant does in 64. So uh, he had the right idea, but th when it came to take that uh, risk, uh, he was very adverse to it. The ability to look at the big picture instead of going battle to battle, did that plague northern generals at the time? I, I, they seemed to. Uh, uh, McClellan, uh, his successor Ambrose Burnside, then Joseph Hooker, even George Meade, who uh, certainly deserved great credit for Gettysburg. Uh, considering he was given command of the army three days before it. Uh, they seemed to conduct their campaigns of one battle f at a time, and once that battle's fought, we will see what we're going to do. Where Grant was so uh, uh, superior to him, he viewed a battle as an ongoing part of a, a destination. It's just, you know, th we are going down a road, if you will, and that road will lead us to, we hope, victory. And when he came east, I mean, he, they suffered horrific casualties. 
But Grant never turned back, never swayed because the ultimate goal was down the road. So if we fight the battle here, well, the next day we're moving on your right. Uh, but that's why I don't think any of the uh, uh, predecessors. Now, Grant technically never commanded the army. Right. Meade always did. But from about the second day of op the wilderness, Grant directed the army. It was it was his army and the f what they were going to do with it. Uh, and uh, none of them had, uh, I don't think any of the preceding commanders would have won the war in the East unless he had somebody like Grant. Was there an intimidation factor with Lee? Yes, uh, I'm, there are. Uh, what I found was surprising, I think with some of the rank, and you, you hear some of the officers write about it, and uh, oh, I guess 30 years ago now, somebody wrote a book called Our Masters of Rebels, and yep. he made that argument, uh, Michael Adams did, and uh, there's elements of that, and I think maybe, you know, Hooker, why, you know, he bragged and then he, he faces Lee head-to-head -head at Chancellorsville. What a remarkable movement, and then all of a sudden seemed to have lost his nerve. In fact, there was a point in your book called, you know, The Sword of Lincoln, where at Chancellorsville, Lee just assumes Hooker won't attack. Exactly. He and, just assumed it. Right. He, and uh, he... And, for, and, and Hooker had bragged and bragged, you know, even uh, issued a, an, a glowing uh, uh, order to the Army once they had outflanked. And he had outflanked Lee. It was a brilliant maneuver and well-conducted. And yes, Lee did. And uh, now what I also found on the other hand, and among the rank and file, the common soldiers, even after seven days after Antietam, even after Fredericksburg, uh, admittedly, they understood that, you know, please give us a general that is, well, turns out worthy of them. But they believed that they could meet the Confederates on any field of battle in a fair fight and whip them. So they, they certainly wrote about Lee and Jackson, and they appreciated their, their excellence as officers. But at the same time, the rank and file wasn't intimidated. It, it tended to be more up in the ranks of the Army. In fact, that's one of the big misconceptions that you bring out in, in the book. Um, and you talk about this in the book, which is a great narrative, and all the research that you've done, that people felt that, oh, they had to be demoralized. They suffered more defeats than victories. You found through your research and letters that that was not the case with this army. No, I think one of its defining characteristics was resiliency. I mean, yeah. you could, you, in a world we live in, however you want to say it, you could take a sports analogy if you want of a, a, an excellent team that just is beaten and right. beaten. And yet there's that element there that if it's tapped, right. that element uh, can turn the whole thing around. And Grant tapped. I think one of the great moments in its history, and I, I, I do it, uh, is on May 7, 64, it's midnight. They've just been through the Battle of the Wilderness, and they come to a crossroads. All preceding generals would have taken them straight ahead back across the river. If you turn right or south, you're going after them. And Grant and the men cheered them. Yeah. I mean, they knew what was ahead. I mean, they knew the horrors of combat that awaited them. But they cheered them finally because somebody was taking them where they wanted to go. And yes, they had, uh, after Fredericksburg, where it was a horrific battle, uh, for probably January and February 63, desertions were in the thousands. Now they were temporary, most men came back. They were, it was a low point. But yet, you know, a few months later, they're at Chancellorsville willing to fight, you know, and here you have, a, as you point out, you have this Army of Northern Virginia under Lee whose reputation is building and building and building. And that's why I think Gettysburg's so important for the Army of the Potomac because it became redemption. You know, when they shout to the rebels, come on, come on, come to death, yeah. you know, they, they were waiting on them. Let's talk about Gettysburg. Okay. Uh, Meade takes over three days before Gettysburg begins. His strategy at Gettysburg, was it any different than his predecessors in terms of how he dealt with Lee? No, uh, there is, he came onto the battlefield after the first day. Uh, he was told that, he asked the question, is this good ground? And he was told it was. But yet, on the morning of July 2nd, Lee I mean, excuse me, Meade considered going in the offensive, which would be the Culp's Hill area, if people are familiar with it. Generals came back and said, uh, you know, that's not very good ground. Well, then the decision was made, more or less, to see what Lee was going to do that day. And I think, for Meade, Lee gave him the battle Meade needed to have. Uh, I don't think Meade was at the point 
where he could, you know, do an offensive strike uh, well or handle an offensive battle. So he fought in the defensive. Uh, Meade handled his uh, units very skillfully. Uh, Winfield Scott Hancock, a Pennsylvanian, uh, like Meade, uh, was probably the, the officer who could be most classified as a hero because mm -hmm. uh, he conducted uh, the federal forces on the southern end of the field the last two days and against Pickett's charge. But yeah, Meade, Meade made a few mistakes, and the Confederate High Command made a number of mistakes, but L Lee was determined to strike him, and, and I believe, you know, he came to Pennsylvania for a variety of reasons, but one of the reasons was, and maybe the most important, is to settle it, to win the war. Because right. I think Lee understood that as time goes by, they're doomed. Uh, it, it, you know, if the North finally gets a general who will put that manpower and military might together, the Confederacy's doomed. Well, a war of attrition, he exactly. can't win. He, he, and he understood that. Right. Me, though, in relative terms, lets him off the hook in terms of letting Lee get out of there. At least, is that how Lincoln perceived oh, it? Oh, absolutely. But uh, it's estimated probably at least 40% of the Army of Potomac went left Gettysburg barefoot. We always think of Confederates right. barefoot. Uh, the supplies, they were hungry. I know on July 3rd, you read accounts of men who were just looking for anything to eat. They had outstripped their supply lines. And what also is interesting, people, uh, Lee, uh, Lincoln sort of overlooked this. Uh, Meade's primary job was to protect Washington, Baltimore. So when the battle's over, you still have this wily Lee, where's he going? Is he gonna go and turn around? So. Meade's initial move as far as infantry went was to move everybody south towards Frederick to protect Washington. Then he went after Lee. Uh, for his reputation, he probably should not have allowed his corps commanders to talk him out of a, at least tr trying an attack uh, on July 13th, uh, but he bowed to them and then he was going to go ahead on July 14th and the Confederates retreated during the night. And Lincoln probably never forgave him. But to be honest about it, it was probably the best defensive position the Confederates had held except for Fredericksburg. Yeah. So uh, it was miles and miles and, and uh, I, I think that it, I think if Meade would have went forward in a uh, major attack and been badly bloodied, it would have negated some of the effect of Gettysburg. Well, as you point out in the book, The Sword of Lincoln, uh, on several occasions, it's Lincoln's directive or at least through the government's director, that Washington must be protected at all costs. How much did that weigh in the back of the minds of generals such as Meade when he was in a position where if he took a shot, maybe Washington was vulnerable? Oh, I think it's uh, there for the first three years of the war. Uh, the army is tethered to Washington, if you will. Uh, and in all reality, the Confederacy could only win a political settlement. If the chance arose that they could possibly capture Washington or even, you know, for, hold it for a day or two, uh, the symbolic uh, victory and the political consequence would probably lead to Confederate independence. And Lincoln understood it. At the same time, Lincoln had this delicate balancing act between, well, he and McClellan was a major source of dispute, between how many men you leave in the army, how many men you keep in the defenses. But uh, the constant always was that uh, the security of Washington cannot be jeopardized, and they operate under that. The book is The Sword of Lincoln from Simon & Schuster. Jeffrey Ward, thank you so much. Thank you. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.